Good morning, everyone. We are here again in a new episode of A Word in Your Ear. I have to say hi to Lee and Grace. Hi, how are you guys? Good. Hi, Lee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Thank having you. me. So let's start with the language, Chinese. How would you describe Chinese, your mother tongue? Well, um, Lutes, I, I would say in contrast to phonograms that you have in Roman languages, Chinese is rather a symbol-based language or logograms, if you like. Uh, for example, if you look at the screen, you will see this Chinese character, Shan, meaning mountain. So these logograms are known as characters, Chinese characters, and they are the smallest unit of meaning. Um, a full Chinese word may consist of two or three or even more Chinese characters. Um, in order to be able to read newspaper and books, one is expected to have at least 3,000 Chinese characters. And I think for us interpreters, uh, perhaps one thing worth noting is that we can use these Chinese characters um, as a huge repository um, of symbols that we can use during our consecutive uh, interpreting assignments. And we always scribble with uh, one or two of these Chinese characters, which come in handy. Um, and besides that, I would say tones are heavily used in Chinese to distinguish words, uh, such as ma, uh, the first tone meaning mother, and you have ma, the third tone meaning horse, and ma to scold. Um, in terms of grammar, Chinese has no tenses uh, as opposed to English and other languages. No voices, no numbers, I mean, the difference in singular and plural forms, and owning a few articles. Syntax rules in Chinese are rather loose. Um, you will always find a subject dropping here and a pronoun dropping there. So to find the verb would be an important piece of advice. So to quickly grasp the gist of a Chinese sentence. Uh, if you look at this, lao hu yao si le ren, tiger, bite, die, a man. Um, it actually means the tiger bit a man to death. So no tense, bite or bit, no verb. Uh, so the verbs are stacked together. You have bite and die. And man is the subject of the first verb, which is bite. And the subject um, of the second verb, which is die. So you have a high level of flexibility in forming the sentences in Chinese once you've learned the basics. Wow, that's very interesting. And uh, interpreters love flexibility, don't we? Uh, one question, does salami technique or chunking technique, for instance, work uh, for Chinese too? What are the biggest difficulties interpreting into and out of Chinese? Oh, well, that was a very good question. And the answer is definitely yes. Um, in fact, trunking is absolutely needed as sentences tend to be half a page long in your typical script for speeches. And it is the number one survival skill for simultaneous interpreting. Um, and Chinese is no exception. And as Leo has just explained just now, that there are a lot of moving around and reformulation of sentences. So I think as a Chinese interpreter, my advice is uh, to always keep a safe distance from the original language so that you got enough space to form your own sentences in Chinese without the contamination from the original language. Um, as to your second question, I believe that finding a cultural equivalence can be a very big obstacle for interpreters uh, bridging the communication gap because we know Oriental culture can be very distant and unfamiliar to our audiences in other parts of the world. And we have to always bear that in mind when we're working in and out of Chinese. Uh, well, I can give you an example. For instance, in the Chinese culture, the fishermen before uh, they set sail, they would say their prayers to Ma Zu, Ma Zu, or the goddess of the sea. And well, you're required to translate that concept from Chinese, you think to yourself, well, Poseidon, the Greek god of the sea, be sufficient to do the job. And mind you that Poseidon is a bad-tempered and moody male god, 
not a goddess, uh, unlike in Chinese, it's a goddess. So interpreters are required uh, to make a judgmental call whenever a culture-specific expression comes up. Uh, Grace has um, uh, brilliantly explained that. Uh, perhaps I'd just add by saying that there are uh, a lot of uh, or four letter words, there's set phrases and idioms used uh, in Chinese, and they convey very deep and sometimes implicit meanings. Uh, these phrases um, appear a lot in uh, texts like government official uh, speeches or other high profile businessmen speeches. And of course, as you can imagine, there are no strangers to interpreters and they require some flexibility and a lot of times a quick explanation to get the message across. Working from Chinese, we don't always have the luxury of getting across these flowery expressions by using some concise and readily available equivalents in target languages uh, like English or French. So sometimes we need to explain a bit more or simply reformulate them in a plain language. So it's very challenging, but equally rewarding, I would say, when you've nailed one at work. That's really amazing, really amazing what you do in the Chinese booth, really. And you do that all the time, which is, yeah, as I say, it's amazing. But tell me now, the market, market prospect. Interpreters adding Chinese to their language combination. Is that possible? How's the market? Can you explain a bit how it goes with the Chinese? Um, well, perhaps I'll start with an overview of the Chinese speaking population. Uh, Chinese uh, as a language is spoken by about 1.6 billion people, or if you like, that's 16% of the world's population. So out of all its dialects, um, Mandarin or Putonghua, meaning common language, is the modern standard of Chinese uh, commonly used in education, business, uh, scientific research, etc. So Mandarin may be the form of Chinese that uh, our interpreter colleagues wish to learn. And Mandarin Chinese is also one of the six languages, official languages used at the United Nations. So it's not an official language in the European Union, uh, but sometimes you do see a Chinese booth in various committee meetings under the big EU umbrella or some bilateral meetings between EU and Chinese leaders. Right. And as Chinese booth, uh, most of the time we have to work both ways, meaning in and out of Chinese, as is the case in the freelance market and most of the institutional market as well. And while it is not uncommon to see some Chinese Cs being added to some interpreters with Western languages, uh, it is quite rare to encounter someone who has, say, Chinese B and French A or Chinese B and Spanish A or Arabic A. So I believe that adding Chinese as a B or C language will open many doors for you as an interpreter. Uh, you'll be able to work for the UN and its organizations and agencies such as the International Maritime Organization, the International Labor Organization, or the uh, World Bank to, to just name a few. And so to be able to offer interpreting services in Chinese, I think you sign up for continuous language learning, culture study, and knowledge expansion, just like working in any other languages. Um, as a language is constantly changing and evolving, and I think that you will never be bored and hopefully always marvel at the beauty of this very beautiful Asian language. I have to ask you then, you see a very good future in the profession for this language. You see the boothies, you know, growing? What do you think? Um, well, I, I think first of all, uh, with online meetings, uh, remote forms of um, this profession interpreting, uh, we do see these uh, traditional working mode has uh, shifted to other modes, be it working at home or working in other modes, um, half uh, virtual and half face-to-face, -face, 
hybrid meetings, I think these trends will open new markets. And so Chinese as a main language, uh, not only uh, in the UN system, but also uh, the common language uh, that uh, you, you, you always have the benefit of learning and uh, uh, using its uh, um, uh, role to, to communicate ideas in this international communication, international conferences. I think adding Chinese uh, will always give you new markets because uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, there are a lot of international companies trying to tap into the market of China, and there are Chinese companies going overseas as well. And I think this um, two directions, uh, this mm -hmm. dynamics will also open up doors for uh, not only uh, business um, meetings, but also international conferences in uh, different sectors uh, from, from legal to pharmaceutical to economic conferences. I think these opportunities are really limitless, I would say. Great. Yeah, and you Something said to add? <laughs> sure. Um, you're, you were asking whether or not Chinese booth is getting bigger and bigger. And the answer, I believe, is definitely yes, because I still remember in the first uh, two or three years of my interpreting career, um, I believe that about 90% of the time I'm translating, I'm interpreting from English into Chinese and only 10% of the time I'm interpreting from Chinese into English. And over all this year, I think things have changed a lot. You see more and more Chinese speakers want to have their voice heard in the world. And therefore you have about like 50% to 50% both ways. And okay. I think that's a, that's a trend and it is, I don't know if that is irreversible, but I believe that having Chinese is definitely going to be a big asset. Well, that's very good for you. And uh, one last question, because I suppose you're very busy. COVID times. Um, uh, perhaps I should first of all point out that Grace and I are based in Hong Kong, Hong which Kong. is still mm -hmm. a bit different from uh, yeah, the markets I mean... in the mainland China. And mm. COVID just exacerbated that because Hong Kong has not yet resumed normal travel with uh, the Chinese mainland. So ah. it actually separated uh, the two markets even more. Um, but I would say before COVID, Hong Kong, um, um, uh, I could say, um, was proud to be one of the major offshore markets for uh, financial activities and Chinese companies looking for going public overseas. Uh, so that's why we did uh, a lot of business meetings like IPOs, roadshows, uh, results announcement, quarterly, yearly announcements, and uh, uh, this investment banking meetings, analyst meetings, um, uh, economic outlook seminars, etc. cetera. Um, as, you, as you know, Hong Kong is one of the main um, international financial hubs in the world. So uh, to have these meetings uh, going on even during these difficult times uh, is not only uh, doing the justice to this financial market, um, but also um, uh, I could say one of the uh, necessities in Hong Kong, because in, in Hong Kong, you have this large um, Hong Kong stock exchange, uh, which requires companies listed on the market uh, to um, release um, a public information in both English and Chinese. This is uh, almost like a statutory requirement. So that gives interpreters a lot of opportunities, be it online, or face-to-face. -face. Of course, before they were face-to-face, -face, but now with online meetings, these meetings uh, could go on. And uh, I, I should also point out that uh, online formats of meetings also add opportunities to our work portfolio. Because previously, imagine um, a fund manager from the US would have to pay a visit to a company in Hong Kong um, because a lot of Chinese companies uh, had the headquarters in Hong Kong. That's why these international investors are always interested in paying a visit to their offices here. And before COVID, they had to travel, fly from uh, New York to Hong Kong and spend a few days visiting these companies. But now this long travel 
could be converted into a few short online meetings, and that could give interpreters some flexible work schedule as well. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. It's very good. So, I mean, it, there wasn't really, a, you, you didn't really stop then. You have been working all the time, right? Um, I, I cannot say, uh, perhaps Grace could add to this, I, I cannot say our work was not affected at all. It was, of course, like other markets. Uh, but and there was I something say, going on. Uh, it, 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 there were a few major trends, uh, like these economic recovery in China, and uh, uh, this necessity of uh, keeping the financial hub afloat, um, make it possible that we can still go on with uh, some rudimentary, with some uh, bread and butter jobs, if you like. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, that's great, mm. that's very good. Very happy for you. So now, imagine, to finish, you have a student who has just finished uh, a master in conference interpreting somewhere in the world, and it's thinking of adding Chinese two sentences for him or for her. What would you say to them if I mean if he's thinking or she's thinking of uh, adding Chinese? Some advice to finish. Grace, um, I would challenge any potential student of Chinese interpreting to do some tongue twisters because that would be very interesting and very fun. Uh, and also to try out the four tones because that's going to be, I think that's quite essential Chinese language uh, as different from any like Western languages. So that would be my advice and good luck to all of those uh, students uh, who have mm -hmm. the aspiration of adding Chinese. Good. And you, Leo, to finish? And um, my advice would be to um, try to build a very strong capability of both working into Chinese and from Chinese, because uh, by adding Chinese to your language combination, you expect a real uh, bi-active interpreting uh, format, because we mm -hmm. really expect that interpreters can work both ways. You can't just add Chinese as a mm -hmm. passive language. Uh, well, uh, that, that, that's doable, but almost unrealistic for you if you need to survive the market. Okay, well, mm -hmm. thank you very much to both of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Very interesting. Um, also because we've been working on this video for a long, long time. So in the end, we, we've, we've made it. So it's done. Good. And I really hope this is helpful for all these students just looking for new things or, you know, exotic things to find a new future in our interpreting world.